um, please, if you could just write down in the chat box, um, if you can or if you can't, that would be really helpful. Um, so um, there, there is a chat box uh, at the bottom of your screen, bottom left, where you can write down comments and questions. Um, I will try to reply to your comments as they come in and save all your questions for our speaker to look at after her presentation. Excellent. Th thank you for letting me know, Puja and Elsa and Cynthia and Kelly. Wonderful. Um, so we are very happy to have Karen Watkins with us. She's going to present how to use hair mineral testing in clinic, how to take samples, and how to understand the results and apply them in your clinic. We will look at how the testing can benefit your patients, explore answers to frequently asked questions, and cover toxic element exposure and how to treat this. Karen is a nutrition therapist who qualified with ION, the Institute of Optimum Nutrition, and has spent the last 12 years working in the field of hair mineral analysis with one of the most respected laboratories in the field. Karen is a well-known lecturer, lecturing on hair mineral analysis, laboratory testing, and toxic minerals to practitioners, and at many of the nutrition therapy training colleges. Karen has undertaken research, published articles, and provides the technical support to practitioners and mineral check. So, on to you, Karen, please. Lovely, thank you. Um, so thank you for inviting me. I've just had a quick look through the um, list of people in the room and it's lovely to see some people I already know. So hello, and there's some new people as well. So let's see how this works. This is my first webinar, so it's really quite exciting for me. Um, Cora's just given me a lovely introduction, so I thought we would start. Uh, Mineral Check represents trace elements, the American laboratory here in the UK. We've been working in the field of hair analysis, the lab, for 20, 24, 25 years. And the company that I work with has been representing them here in the UK for the last 18 years. I've got lots of experience with the test. And so putting this together was kind of a little bit, Cora asked me a question. I went, oh, at the beginning, I didn't put that in there. So we'll make a start. And I will be adding a bit, few bits to the slides as we go. So I thought I would start by just giving you the basic of the cost. The test that I'll be talking about he can have a graph only, and I'll show you what that looks like in a minute. And that is £33 to you, the practitioner. And the retail on it is £59. Or you can have it with an interpretive report, and that's £39 with a retail of £69. And retests are a little bit cheaper. Those of you that are working with us already will think, well, that's not the right price. Um, so that's a little reminder for you that the prices go up tomorrow, the 1st of March. So... In order to access the testing with us, you just need to register. That's quite an easy thing to do. You can drop me an email, karen at mineralcheck.com, and say that you heard us on the presentation, or you can go to our website, mineralcheck.com, and there's um, a space there for practitioners to register. Very, very easy. Once you're registered, we send you out the test kits, and you can start testing. So for those of you that haven't seen what a test looks like, here we have one. Now, on my screen, this is quite small. So, um, yes, I've just seen there is a full screen button for you. So that's brilliant. You can pull that up. This is just a sample report. Uh, this will be the graph only. And you can see the first box covers the nutritional elements. The next box, the pink one, covers the toxic elements. And the next box underneath are just the additional elements. The additional elements, if you've ever spoken to me on the phone, you'll know that I get really quite excited about those because I read a lot of the research. But as practitioners, the bit that you're interested in really is the top line. And when you phone or are thinking about interpreting, the ratios is the important bit, which is on the back. And I'm going to cover this evening how those all fit together and what they all mean. The first test I ever did was actually this one. This is how I got into hair analysis. So I just always put it up when I lecture because I think it's quite a fun one. It is the chart of my horse. I was a student practitioner at the time 
Um, I was just leaving ION and I, I tested my horse, that old adage that as practitioners, students, we'll tell everybody else what to do, we'll get other people to do it and we'll see if it works, we'll do a bit of experimentation on ourselves and I tested my horse. And he has right over on the right hand side excessively high aluminium and he definitely had behavioural issues. There is a lot of research on behavioural issues and aluminium done on young offenders and I decided this horse was definitely material for a young offenders institute. The aluminium will have come from the soil. The soil is a 14% aluminium compound and in an acidic environment, so acid rain, that, re that aluminium breaks down very quickly. There is a chemical compound in plants that actually stops them absorbing aluminium, which is why we can grow our plants for eating in aluminium rich soil, but why their plants don't absorb the aluminium. And there is some fascinating research coming out of the University of Surrey, which shows that in a highly stressed environment, so alongside the M25, that, that protective measure has broken down and plants have started to absorb the aluminium. I find that fascinating because I, don't, I think it's not a million miles away to make that leap of if in a highly stressed environment plants start to absorb the toxins they grow in, in a human, in a stressful situation, it is perhaps likely that we will start to absorb toxins as well. Now, I'm going to cover the heavy metals a little bit at the end if we have the time. And if I run out of time, and I did time this, and once it took me loads longer than an hour, and once I did it perfectly within the hour with time for questions. So I think that says that sometimes I have a tendency to chat a lot. Um, but I have put a slide in on aluminium because you are not going to be working with horses. You're going to be working with humans who will come up with high aluminium. So we've covered the stress reaction, but also, well, where do people get aluminium from? And it's actually incredibly common. It will show up in deodorants, in lotions, in soaps. Aluminium silicate is found in salts, in water softeners. We, a lot of our clients will use aluminium foil. Some plants contain, like fruit and vegetables, contain trace amounts, baking powder, cigarette smoke, pesticides. Truth, um, drinking water is often a source of some aluminium. Quite interestingly, the Brita jug water filters will take out about 90% of the aluminium that's in our drinking water. And the reason the aluminium is our drinking water is it is put there to actually clean it and then it's filtered back out again. But of course, that filtration is not 100%. So that's one source. And then when we get to the um, end, you'll see I've covered some more. A little bit more about aluminium in that it is very poorly absorbed in humans, but it's easily antagonized with magnesium um, and then is excreted through the urine. One of the things that I think is fascinating is that we can find a toxic element, we can look up the relationship with the nutritional elements and we can use those to help the body remove them. So for those of you who have spoken to me quite a lot, you'll know that when a toxic element does appear, I don't go down the detox route. I will say let's look at the nutritional elements and let's support the body to remove a toxin. So, how do elements get into the hair and why would we test the hair? As the hair is growing underneath the scalp, it's exposed to an internal metabolic environment. And that's where, that, as it washes over the hair shaft, the hair shaft hardens and creates a pattern of that internal environment. The hair then grows out and that pattern is locked in so we can cut the hair off and we have a pattern of what was happening when the hair was growing. And that's why when we do the test, we always say the sample should be no longer than four centimetres. The ideal place to take a sample is on the back of the head. I put a little note here about using clean scissors. A while ago, we had um, a, num a practitioner who used a, a pair of scissors. All of her tests showed really, really high iron. I couldn't work out why she would have so many clients with a high iron area, high iron. And one day I just said to her, could you look at the scissors and the little traces of rust on the scissors? Um, so I, I now put on my slides clean scissors. I'm sure you would all be using clean scissors. 
but the hair sample comes from the back of the head, no longer than four centimetres and close to the scalp because we want the most recent pattern. There are other possibilities for sampling, and these will include the nails or pubic hair. The problem with those two samples, is, or even chest hair or something like that, the problem with those samples is that they have a different growth physiology. Pubic hair and body hair grows to a certain length, hangs around for a while, and then drops out. So you don't know when testing how old that pattern would be. And of course, nails take a long time to grow from the bed of the nail to a part that you can cut off. So you know that's an old pattern. So personally, I would not use pubic hair, chest hair, any body hair or nails unless there was a very convincing reason to do so. And for me, a very convincing reason is complete alopecia. And that's about it. I do use pubic hair and I, for confirming something. So if, and I'm going to show you a slide in a minute of um, the potential of an, ex, an endogenous problem, uh, sorry, an external problem. Most of what we're looking at is endogenous, which means it comes from within the body. In some cases, we may suspect an external contaminant, and that's when I would go back and the lab will free of charge test a pubic hair sample for that one element. So I will show you what that means very shortly, so I will come back to that point. Some people suggest that they don't want to test head hair because they do not want to cut the hair um, because they're worried the sample will show. It doesn't. I frequently cut my own using the office scissors, which makes my colleagues laugh. But I I just whip the hair up, take the office scissors and lop a bit off. And then because I will test only the two, three centimetres nearest the scalp, I just cut off the rest and throw it in the office bin. I don't think it's ever really shown. My hairdresser has occasionally said, oh, Karen, you've been taking a lot of samples here. But on the whole, it doesn't show because you're doing it from underneath. There are some external elements and people do worry about hair dye. The problem with hair dye and the reason we say don't use dyed hair is that some of the dyes can contain lead acetate. So something that makes the hair black will often do that using lead. And that's why we say don't use a hair dye. There is some research suggesting that bleach can artificially elevate calcium. That is highly unlikely. And I have seen so many samples here that artificial elevation of calcium is rarely ever caused by bleach. I think in 15 years, I've only seen two or three where we couldn't explain where the calcium was elevated. So I don't worry about dyeing or bleaching of the hair unless it is black. And then I might talk to the person about how they got their hair to be dyed black. Perming can artificially elevate magnesium. So I wouldn't test newly permed hair. I would wait for it to be washed a few times. Um, four or five is fine. The reason is that the magnesium is used in the relaxing lotion to stop the curls curling up too tight. So three or four, five, six washes after perming, absolutely fine. Medicated shampoos like head and shoulders will contaminate the sample. So with shampoo, I always ask when I'm going to take the sample in clinic if the person is using a medicated shampoo. And if they are, I ask them to take the sample themselves after they've washed their hair for a few times. Three or four is fine with something like a baby shampoo. And then the final possible external influence here is I put swimming. There are some pools that use copper to clean the water. They use a copper sulfate. There are very, very few of them. But if you find high copper in someone who swims, a quick call to the pool will reveal what they clean up the water with. Um, I've only ever seen that on samples coming out of Scotland and one pool in Surrey. It's very, very rare, but it's always worth thinking about. So I pop this slide in because people do ask me about external contaminants. And as you can see, this is Gordon, and he has an exceptionally high lead level, really high. I'm used to putting these up in um, public, and I can point with my laser pointer. Um, so the lead is on the right-hand side, and it's off the scale. Now, it is so high that with, in that case, 
the lab will send through a notice asking me to call the practitioner and warn the practitioner that is coming because it's excessively high and we expect that to be an external contaminant. And it just gives the practitioner time to think about it. And in this case, Gordon was using Grecian 2000 to dye his hair. He initially told the practitioner he wasn't, um, but on his retest, the lead was still high. And she asked me what I thought, and I said that I genuinely suspected he was using Grecian 2000 and to be a little bit firmer with him about that. And he did confess then he was. So the, it, I just put that slide in so that you can see how very, very obvious an external contaminant is. And it's rare. I had to go back quite a way to find this one. I knew it, I put it in because I absolutely know it's an external contaminant. So why would we test the hair? It is a very safe test to do, and it's non-invasive. It is a general overview of the nutrients and toxic elements found in the hair. So I describe it as a screening test because it's not diagnostic of anything. And it will give you a general overview. I would test the hair for most of my own clients, but then I use the test a lot. So I'm going to just run through possibly other options for testing, which would include tissue testing, blood testing, and urine testing. Tissue testing is actually quite a difficult one to do. I'm just going to flip back a slide. I, sorry about that. I flicked through too many slides. Tissue testing is a difficult one to do because we can't really take samples of a body tissue. So as practitioners, we're left with um, the hair, which is a tissue we can sample, the blood, which is an option, or urine testing. Urine testing is inconvenient. It will show the losses, but that is all. And you don't know why someone would be losing something. You could use a an antagonist to try and chase it out, but then you don't know if the body has a load of a toxic element and you force that out by giving an antagonist, or whether or not you just force some out and you don't really know the body load with urine. It's also inconvenient because you have to collect the urine over a 24 hour period. So we tests that your clients are familiar with are blood tests and red blood cells. I was chatting to a practitioner earlier in the week about why we would use blood tests. And one of the problems with a blood test is our doctors, GPs, are very, very familiar with it and they will test the blood. And they test it because they're looking for a disease. And that is quite different to why we will test. The GP is coming at the patient from a perspective of looking for the illness. Whereas I think as naturopathic practitioners, we're coming at it from a perspective of how do we create wellness? So although blood tests are widely recognized, they don't really reflect exactly what is going on. And calcium is a fantastic example of this. The body will hold calcium in a very tight range. It will only allow calcium to go out of that range if there is a problem, for example, with the parathyroid, like a parathyroid tumour. And that's about it. So the calcium will always be in that range. So testing the blood for calcium, a GP will do that because they are looking for a pathology. From our point of view, if the pathology is found, the medical profession will investigate. But from our point of view, we know if the client has got a pathology because they've told us about it when they come in. So we don't really want to know that the body's holding it within range. We want to know more about how the body is utilizing the calcium. And that's where a tissue test comes in. So the hair will give you an average. It won't tell you what's happening in an hourly right now moment, but it will give you an average. Its disadvantage is that it can be contaminated, which is why we will do a pubic sample. So that if we see, for example, in the slide I popped up of Gordon, the lead is off of the scale. We suspect that's a contaminant. We think it's from his hair dye. We want to know if there's a body load of lead and therefore we'll test his pubic hair free of charge for lead only so that we can see if the external contaminant has affected the body. 
in most cases it possibly has, but it gives you the confirmation that's really what's going on. I put the slide in because I think this is a really old um, piece of research, but I find it fascinating. Animals were given 300 parts per million of cadmium, so a toxic element in their drinking water. Their average intake would have been 4.5 milligrams over 12 weeks. And then what the researchers did was they tested the liver by a biopsy, the kidneys by a biopsy, and the hair. And what they found were that peak levels of cadmium were found in the kidneys, the liver, and the hair at four weeks, and that the hair reflected what was found in the liver and the kidneys. So I really like the study because it gives me the confidence that what I'm seeing in the hair is reflective of what is being found within the body. And very interestingly, they also tested the blood of the cows and the blood level never changed. There was never any cadmium showing in the blood. So I think that this gives us, it has actually been replicated in later ones, but I, I like this one because it's so, so clear. It gives us a really good indication that when we test the hair, we are getting a good reflection of what is happening in the body. The one thing that I do think that blood tests are very, very useful for are functional B vitamins. With the blood hair, we can only test for the minerals. The vitamins can't be tested. We do make suggestions on the report when we go view the interpretation and all of our test results will come with a supplement protocol and that protocol will include some recommendations for vitamins. So we make those because we know about the relationship between the minerals and vitamins and a, a classic example of that would have been zinc. We know that if zinc is very low um, and yet the client has a good dietary intake of zinc, that there is either a high biochemical need or there is a shortage of B6. So we might supplement the zinc, but we will know that that person also is going to need B6 in order to get the zinc absorbed. The test results will give you an example, an overview of the mineral levels the toxic elements, but also we can look at the state of mind, we can look at immunity, we can look at thyroid function as well as the toxic elements. And what I would like to do today is just cover what those results mean. I know that we won't get to the toxic elements, but I've left those slides on because I'm hoping, and I should have checked with Cora, that you can download them because I think that they will be useful when you um, do some testing. So I wanted to put up a test for a real person. And this is Jane. She's actually one of my own clients. And you can see here, she has a very high calcium level. Her magnesium level is reasonably high. It looks quite good. She has a very high copper level and a very low zinc level. The rest of the elements are okay. Very low molybdenum, which is key for the toxic elements, which she has quite a few of. She has arsenic, mercury, cadmium, lead, and aluminium all showing. And so if I look at her ratios, I can see a little bit more about what's going on. So I just want to explain the ratios for you. A ratio is a comparison of one element to another, and you get it by dividing one mineral level by another. And we do this because the minerals do not work in isolation. So if I had a calcium level of 60 and a magnesium level of 5, that would give me a ratio of 12 to 1. And the ratios become significant because we can start to assess what's going on, not just the levels themselves, but we have some other indications. So the calcium phosphorus ratio will tell us about the metabolic person. And I say to Cora, I've just been writing some stuff on met metabolic typing and how we can use hair analysis and on the history of metabolic rate typing. And um, I might well come back and do another presentation on that one because I find it absolutely fascinating. But the hair analysis will give you a clue about metabolic rates. And we can get fast and slow metabolizers. And I've put two slides on here. And within the fast and the slow type, we get a very distinct pattern of what is happening with the adrenals and with the thyroid. 
one of the things I commented about Jane is that she had extremely elevated calcium. Now, that's actually very, very common in the UK. About 85% of our tests will show um, elevated calcium. Now, that if we compare it with Scandinavia, only 51% does. Um, and we're much higher than the States, where only about 65% do. There are lots of reasons why tissue calcium elevates. Um, predominantly, we are looking at why, what it means, it's high. So that means it's not being used. And that's usually because of a deficiency of other nutrients or those other nutrients are biounavailable. That excess calcium will be being deposited in the soft tissues, so joints, arteries, lymph nodes. But very often people will report joint stiffness and it will be due to the excess calcium. I seem to manage to flick through these slides quite easily. Hang on a second. So there are four main reasons of why the calcium will elevate. And it will elevate because of a lack of vitamin E, C or B6, a lack of magnesium or manganese, an adrenal issue or a thyroid issue, so adrenal thyroid ratio together, or it will elevate because of a protein metabolism issue. So somebody is not digesting their protein or simply not eating it enough. And that's something that we look at in association with the diet. Um, the sodium and potassium ratio, and I'm not gonna read the slides for you because I think that's something that you can do perhaps later, but I'm happy to send you the slides if you don't pick them up. Um, and I know Cora said, yes, you can download them. So that's great. So the sodium and potassium ratio, that's what we look at for the adrenals. And that's how very often when I look at one, I will say, oh, the client is adrenally stressed. I've done a lot of ASIs, adrenal stress tests. I no longer do them in practice because I found that just looking at the sodium potassium gave me all the information I needed. And so when I looked at Jane's chart, she had a sodium of four and a potassium of three, very, very low. So that's going to give us a sodium, low sodium potassium ratio. Her ratio was 1.33. Ideally, it would be 2.4. So I know that she is compromised adrenally. And I can back that up by looking at the sodium to magnesium ratio. It's the adrenal glands that can then control the sodium and the potassium. And if I that's how I know that when I see it very low, the person needs adrenal support. But equally, if I see very, very low magnesium as well, I start to know that they are going into the exhausted stage of stress. And then I will also look at zinc and copper. And just Jane had excessively high copper. Her copper level was 11.1, .1, whereas normally I'd expect to see it about three. And her zinc was very low. I would expect to see it around 12 and hers was only seven. So I could tell from this, she has very, very high copper. I would know that she was estrogen dominant. And I just put a little bit about it there. Um, I put another slide in, which I'm not going to cover because there is some more interesting bits coming up. Um, I've put the iron, a little bit here about iron and copper ratio. Iron and copper are really interesting. They work together. If we have a very high copper level because of a contaminant, and we will often see that when somebody is very estrogen dominant, perhaps someone's been on the pill, or perhaps someone is just exceptionally adrenally stressed because it is the adrenals that will make, help the body make the copper binding protein. So we'll look at the iron and copper ratio and that'll tell us what's happening with the iron. Is it being utilized or is it being stored? Or is there a problem with the thyroid as well. Um, if this ratio is skewed, we know that there's going to be a copper find, uh, a thyroid finding. Elevated copper is very, very high when there's um, a, a very high indication that there's something not right with the thyroid. And that doesn't mean that the person's hypothyroid and needs to focus on their thyroid. What it can just mean is you can bring the thyroid back into balance 
if you can remove the copper. So I've whizzed through these and I know that you will want to go back and look at those slides, but that's given me an indication. So when I go back and look at my original chart of Jane, I could see that she was high and would have done it on here. But as I've been whizzing through those slides, I've discovered that my mouse is just oversensitive. So what I looked at with Jane was I could see that she had very high calcium, very low potassium. So I knew her thyroid was in need of support. She had very, very high copper, so I knew she was estrogen dominant and equally that copper would have been affecting her thyroid. I could see she was adrenally stressed. And so I knew there was a problem with the adrenals. I knew therefore the body wouldn't be able to make the copper binding transport protein because that is made in the liver. And it's made in the liver because it gets the signal from the adrenals. And that's where there's this really interesting feedback loop. The adrenals tell the liver to make the copper binding transport protein to mop up the excess copper. The copper in excess suppresses both the thyroid and the adrenals. So they don't send the signal to the liver. So the copper binding transport protein doesn't get made. So the copper gets stored and then suppresses the adrenals even more. So you get a feedback loop going on. So I could see with Jane there was quite a lot of copper. So I knew we needed thyroid and adrenal support. I could see her zinc was very, very low. That would have been feeding into um, a sex hormone imbalance but also would have been affecting her protein digestion. I could see there were a lot of toxic elements. So a very simple chart gave me quite a lot to work on. Um, and I put a slide here on the role of the toxic elements because it comes up on a lot of tests and I don't go, oh, there's a toxic element, let's do a detox. What I tend to say is let's look at rebalancing the person. We'll support the adrenals, we'll use liver support, we'll give detoxifying foods, and though we can put the body into a position where it will naturally excrete the toxic elements. I just have one little override to that. If a person wants to get pregnant and she has a toxic element, all of that general advice goes straight out of the window and I would go for a main detox because the most critical thing in the preconceptual care in the person's mind is they want to get pregnant. And so then I do um, just go for a detox on that element and I would use the minerals that are most likely to help that happen. So if I look at, say, lead, I know it's magnesium. If it's mercury, I know it's selenium. And the report always gives you that. You don't need to know that in your head. The report that comes with the graph will give you those pointers. And what I've done is I've put some slides that I know you can download on things like mercury, antimony, um, all of the ones that will come up. And I don't want to talk those through with you tonight because I know that you get the opportunity to look at those later. What I have put up is a little chart of somebody who has a very high lead level. And I find this one fascinating. This is, um, she had a very high lead level and had been working with her doctor, well, she was working with a nutritional therapist, but her doctor had referred her to the nutritional therapist because her lead never actually went down. Not her lead went down, sorry, her iron never changed. She was anemic. The question had to be, why was she anemic? And the nutritional therapist rang me and said, had I any ideas? And I said, yeah, do the hair analysis, look for lead. You can get lead induced anemia. And what we actually had was a very high lead level. And so taking iron was not necessarily going to correct the lead level, nor was it going to correct the anemia. She had taken iron supplements on and off for 15 years in an attempt to create, correct her anemia. She figured it wasn't really working. And so we have the lead that we're going to work on. Remove the lead, the anemia went. It was a very simple one. I love it when they're as easy as that. They're not always. Um, and I've covered some more of the toxic elements um, for you um, so that you can download them. Um, I'm now going to just sit back because I've got a little bit of time and there are a few things I'd like to go through.
Um, I put this chart in. This is a chart of somebody who is very, very high in mercury. And I thought I would talk through a couple of the charts so that you got a little picture of how I might use them in practice. This is a client, her name is Jean. It didn't scan too well, hence the line, and I do apologize for that. This is Jean. She had been on an anti-candida diet for years. Now, I've done the anti-candida diet, and I bet lots of you have too. It's jolly hard work. But with the anti-candida diet, should have fixed her symptoms. It didn't. Her practitioner told her that just to keep going with it. She did it for years, which I thought was absolutely notable. When she came to see me, she was still following her anti-candida diet, but her symptoms were still chronic fatigue. And one of the things that was so interesting when I did the test was she had a very, very high copper level and a very, very high mercury level. She also has a high calcium level. So my hypothesis was that it wasn't candida per se, but that it was mercury and copper as an issue. Now, methyl mercury, which is a gas that mercury gives off in the gut, feeds the candida. So theoretically, she may well have had a candida at some point, and the mercury had continued to feed that. But I actually did it alongside a CDSA, a stall analysis, and she didn't have any um, candida bugs showing. I did a saliva test as well, and she didn't have any candida present. And I think what had actually happened, she had done the diet for so well, she starved it off. But the mercury and the high copper remained a significant fatiguing factor for her. Also, very, very low sodium, very low potassium ratio, indicating that she was adrenally stressed. And I outlined how copper affects the adrenals. And mercury equally is a, an adrenal toxin. So added to this, we've got a very high calcium. Going back over what I've said this evening, she didn't eat enough protein. She didn't have enough hydrochloric acid. So a really simple thing we can put in the HCL. We can attract, improve the diet. That really helps. We can then look at our antagonists. Our strongest antagonist for mercury is selenium. So if we give that with vitamin E, it will start to lower the mercury. We can give adrenal support. Her blood sugar control was excellent, which the anti-candida diet had resolved. But I would also, I would support the adrenals. And there's then not a lot of pressure coming through the liver because we've got adrenal support and we've got good blood, blood sugar control. So the liver should be able to work on the toxins. So long as I now think about giving enough antioxidants, one of the reasons that calcium elevates is a lack of vitamin C and a lack of vitamin E. So putting those in would be really helpful. And we have a high copper level. Again, so I'm thinking, how do I antagonize that? Well, one of the strongest antagonists for copper is vitamin C. So we start to build a program. The vitamin C will support the adrenals. It will detoxify the copper it will detoxify the mercury slightly. The vitamin E is going to be the antagonist. It works at lower oxygen levels, so it will continue lowering the copper. It will help with the mercury. We give selenium. That will support thyroid function and adrenal function, and it will help bring down the mercury. It's going to be a longer term program, it will take, because her mercury is quite high, we will be looking probably at a year on that. But very slowly, one starts to see improvements by tackling lots of other issues around the main issue. Um, she came with fatigue. She thought it was candida. We do the test. We discover it's mercury. And I think that's a, a really nice little package because we find something that the client can then go away and work on. Um, if we don't find a toxic element, and we don't find any imbalances, again, I think that's really encouraging because we can start to rule things out. Having said that, I have never done a test, which has given me nothing to work on. Um, I always find there's lots and lots to work on. And one of the issues for me about using tests is practitioner support. I feel very, very strongly that as a practitioner, you should be comfortable in phoning the lab and going through a test with them. It is how we all learn. 
So if it's the first test you've ever done, then phone. And invariably, if you phone us, you'll get to talk to me and I'm happy to talk through a specific test with you. I know a couple of people on the seminar tonight, the webinar, um, just drop me an email saying, what does this mean? And I can usually answer back. And if I've picked the email up on my phone, you might well find you get an email back at half past 10 on a Saturday night. Um, or you can call the office. When I started working with Mineral Check, for me, I had to learn a lot about testing, about hair analysis, and I just love sharing that. I'm always so excited if a person finds a test and they phone me up and they ask me a question and my comment is, I really don't know. That's brilliant. I can go away and look it up and you probably might have to wait 24 hours, but then you'll come back with even more information that you probably, more than you ever wanted to know about that little area. But as the years have gone on, those opportunities for me, I think I love, become less and less because as a rule, I will know and be able to talk you through your chart immediately. And I said to a practitioner this afternoon, I'm doing this webinar and I'm really, really worried about it because I can ramble away about these tests for ages. And she said, it's fine, Karen. Just tell them all to phone you. You've never been intimidating. You're really good at talking through the charts. And I was like, that is so good. I feel so much more relieved. I would say phone. If you do a test, phone and talk it through with me. Um, and I'm always happy to do that. So I've just put a final slide here on, on, on the costs. It's a very economical test to do. And um, I've got my details there so that you can call and go through, you can register as a practitioner. You can do that online or you can just drop me an email. And if you have any questions, we've got some time on the seminar to just go through them. I know that you can download the slides, so you've got lots of information there. And I hope that I've given you a bit of an introduction. Um, and I'm going to throw it open and see if anyone would like to put any questions in the chat box so that I can come back to those specifically. And this is kind of where I now worry that no one's going to ask me any. Thank you, Karen. Uh, yes, we, we've not got yet. The, oh, yeah, there, there's one. We have. It's, it's brilliant, Caroline. That's yeah. a really good question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is it a good tech measure for iodine? No, it's not. We don't, we don't actually measure iodine. The reason we don't measure iodine is it is unstable in the hair. The lab have tried on and off over the years to stabilize iodine. It is is not an easy thing to do and every so often they'll have another go at it someone will come up with a way of stabilizing iodine and it just it is not replicable the laboratory is licensed and it is regularly inspected and it is used by the environmental protection agency so a government body in the us everything that the laboratory does has to be completely replicable which means that if we test iodine today and we found a level of 10 milligram percent we have to find exactly the same level 20 minutes later 20 days later 20 weeks later the lab has very strict quality control measures and iodine is too unstable if you're thinking about thyroid function then i would always look at the calcium to potassium ratio because potassium is what will pick up the thyroid hormone and so if the calcium to potassium ratio is very high then there is a hypothyroid issue if there is insufficient potassium the body won't pick up the thyroid hormone and if there is insufficient selenium always worth looking at selenium when you're thinking about thyroid function the body won't release the thyroid hormone so I always look at calcium to potassium ratio and the selenium level when I'm thinking about thyroid function. So I went a little off topic of your question, Caroline, but no, we don't measure that. But we have got some fairly good indicators for thyroid function. OK, there's another question here about how to download the slides, which Cora will cover. Yes, um, I've covered that. Yeah, now Caroline had another question there. Uh, she's asking if you've ever seen a magnesium level higher than calcium. Yeah, I have actually, Caroline. Uh, but goodness, it is rare. Um, there are a couple of things. Okay, yes, you can sometimes see 
it is very, very common. Caroline, I should add, has done quite a few tests um, with, with mineral check. Magnesium is usually low. And I sometimes think, oh, I'm just going to tell the world to take magnesium. It would be a simple solution. Magnesium is low because it's often the first nutrient that is used up in a stress reaction. And so a lot of our clients come to us and they are ill, um, maybe not diagnosably ill by a medical profession, but they are not 100% well. And magnesium will have been used up. So it's very, very common to see low magnesium. But I have seen very high magnesium. And there are a couple of things I think of when I see very high magnesium. And the first thing I will think about is whether or not that is a true level. By what I mean is, has this person got an excellent magnesium level because they are genuinely quite healthy, they are taking sufficient B6 and magnesium together to absorb it and utilize it correctly? And the answer to that question is very often no, but I would think about that. If the magnesium is very, very high, I might think about whether or not just to make sure they haven't been sticking their head under an Epsom salts bath on a daily basis and there's a contaminant from the Epsom salts because that's a magnesium solution. Um, and then the other reason that magnesium sometimes but very rarely appears very high is that the body is storing magnesium to try and balance calcium. And so you see very high magnesium alongside very high calcium. In those cases, it's not higher than the calcium, but it is very, very high. And in those cases, it is a very rare occurrence. The body has stored the magnesium in an attempt to balance calcium, but it will drop away again very, very quickly. So I've kind of answered your question and put lots more information there again. Um, according to Dr. Wilson, there can be hidden toxic elements that don't show up. Do you think that's true? Oh, Layla, that is a brilliant question. Yeah, I do. Um, and I've seen it. But, and this would be my overriding. Yes, I think this is correct. But I would treat what is in front of you. So if you suspect a hidden toxin, and if you find there are indicators that would be suggest there might be. The point is the body has put the toxin into storage. And what the body will do is it will take a toxic element and it will store it in the fatty tissues or the bone and it will not move it again unless there is either a significant stress or an illness or the right nutrients to help it remove them. The body's quite intelligently designed. And so Yes, there are hidden toxins, but I wouldn't focus on them. I would work with what is in front of you so that the body can then adjust and remove the toxic element without there being a, any side effects. So, yes, it's true, but I would work on what is in front of you. Cynthia's asked a question. A lot of clients have been told by the GP that their thyroid TSH levels are fine, but the report comes back as a slow metabolism with low adrenal thyroid function. Oh, OK. Um, Cynthia, that is a brilliant question. I think I always say um, if your GP has told you that your TSH level is fine, can you go back and ask for the actual figure? Because the GP may say that the TSH level is, in inverted commas, fine, which means that the GP is not going to medicate the thyroid. That doesn't mean that the thyroid is not struggling. So. I would say I would like to know the TSH level. I wouldn't just accept fine. And then very often I find when I look at it, I would say the TSH is not high enough to medicate, but it is indicative that the thyroid is beginning to struggle. And this is where we might see it around the three to four. Um, then it's beginning to struggle. And that's where we need to be really mindful of the potassium, help the body pick up the thyroid hormone, the selenium, help the body release the thyroid hormone. Vitamin E, help the body use the selenium. Adrenal function support, help the body remove the stress from the adrenals so that the thyroid doesn't have to compensate. And very often, we can help that thyroid become optimal. The GP was looking for pathology and to medicate. What we're really looking at is a healthier picture. Is this an appropriate test for acerbamus and its present EG post 
a metal on metal on chair. Mm, that's a really good question, Nicola. Yes, it is appropriate, but the problem is, and I've seen this come back with um, hip replacements, for example, that are leaching. What do you do? Um, you can't change the metal implants. But what you can do is put the body into an appropriate position to detoxify. So yes, it's an appropriate test to look for something like um, cobalt, chromium, nickel. But also be mindful that when you find them, yes, a, a metal implant may be leaching. Um, we just have to then support the body to work with that. Elizabeth, can I explain about low molybdenum and the connection with other minerals? Yes, I can. So low molybdenum is really interesting. It's quite common, but molybdenum controls the sulfur, re sulfur reaction. So with we need good levels of molybdenum to get the sulfur working properly. And the reason we need the sulfur to work properly is the heavy metals or the toxic elements will bind to sulfur um, to be excreted. So molybdenum is key in thinking about the toxic elements and the sulfur reaction. And so um, with the chart that I have put into these notes, Jane, well, she has very low molybdenum, we would have to boost that. And there are a couple of ways you can do that. The way I would often do it is with food. Um, beans, lentils are great at increasing molybdenum. I've seen excessively high molybdenum on children that eat a lot of baked beans, and I mean a lot. Um, we can see very high levels of molybdenum. And then there is a super product for raising molybdenum if you need to do it because you're working with someone um, and you're thinking about the detoxification profile. It's a very old product made by Biocare. It's their liquid molybdenum drops. You only need one drop a day. And the reason I mention that is because I have no connection with Biocare. I've just seen it work really, really well in boosting molybdenum levels. So, Elizabeth, did that answer your question? Or was there something else you wanted me to cover about low molybdenum? Yes, I <laughs> Yes, thank you. I love and Caroline's comment. Caroline. Thank you so much, Caroline. Caroline, you've written, I'm finding these tests so useful. Please do another webinar. Yeah, I, I'd love to. Um, we can think of some topics and I will cover them. I, as you know, Caroline, because you've spoken to me on the phone, I can chat away happily for quite a while. Your client with high copper has finally cracked the constipation, which was a big win. That is fantastic, Caroline. Um, high copper can be constipating. And one of the issues with high copper is that if you give your antagonists, you start to release the copper. And if you have a constipation problem, the excreted copper goes into the bowels and just sits there. So the body reabsorbs it. So the copper comes back high again. And so cracking constipation is key for removing a copper. Actually, I'm kind of glad you mentioned that because when I was talking about the toxins, I didn't mention that. And I often feel when I'm talking to practitioners, I'm very tentative about the whole constipation issue because I think oh, the practitioners they know it but sometimes we really need to remember that the absolute basic don't start to remove high copper or a toxic element unless you have the bowels working properly excellent thank you Karen I see Cynthia is typing something um, other than that we don't yet have any Okay, yeah, another question for Cynthia for you, Karen. Uh, I'm getting clients with high sodium and potassium but low calcium and potassium. Yeah, Cynthia, that is really interesting. The high sodium and potassium and the low calcium metabolize, calcium magnesium, fast metabolism, very unusual in the UK. Incidentally, I will just come back to that point, but I do have one practitioner that I work with in the Midlands, and he works with the Pakistani population. And he rang me up one day and said, Karen, I have got a test result. I've never seen it before. I need to talk it through with you. And I pulled it up on the screen to go through it with him. And I looked at it and my first comment was, what's so different about this? And he said, Karen, um, it's, got high so it's got high calcium, low magnesium, low sodium, low potassium. It's a slow metabolizer. What on earth do I do? 
And I found that fascinating because nearly every chart that I see and talk through on a daily basis is a slow metabolizer. So we had a chat and I pulled a lot of his other results that evening because I was fascinated by it. And nearly every one of his charts was a, heart, a fast metabolizer. So I rang him up and asked him some questions. And he works within a Pakistani community. And a lot of them are either immigrating this generation or first generation. And they're all fast metabolizers. And they all eat a very typically Pakistani diet. Uh, I found that absolutely fascinating. Um, so, Cynthia, I'm kind of really interested in what your, your clients are finding because the fast metabolism is unusual in the UK. It is, again, look at the ratio of sodium and potassium just to establish whether or not they need adrenal support. I, ideally, we're looking for sodium magnesium around 2.4. If it is much lower than that, even though they're fast metabolizers, they may need adrenal support. If they have very low calcium magnesium, you may need to supplement both calcium and magnesium together. And I would supplement slightly more magnesium than the calcium because they will use the magnesium up. And also calcium is very, very easy to get from a good diet. Magnesium is harder to get in sufficient quantity to deal with, I think, the lifestyle that most of our patients lead. So, um, yeah. They're all very anxious, stressed and wired. I love that comment, Cynthia. Yeah, I bet a lot of them are fast, fast, metabolic, fast metabolizers type 4. And that is very, very similar to a slow metabolism type 1. Um, but without the calming, sedating effect of the slow metabolism. So yes, anxious and stressed and wired. Giving calcium and magnesium. Calcium is very, very sedating. Um, Elements, nutritional elements like calcium and magnesium, they all have either a sedating influence on the body or a stimulatory effect. And so they possibly need magnesium and so, um, calcium to, to calm them down. Great, I'm glad that answered the question. What I've tried to do this evening is to give an overview. And I've given some very comprehensive slides so that you can download it and thumb through it. Um, and I, I'm more than happy to come back and do um, a webinar through maybe just on something like elevated copper or a toxic element or on adrenals. I do have a presentation on adrenal stress and hair analysis. So we can look at some very specific things if people think that would be helpful. Just go back to Cora on that one. Um, I have hope I've given you an overview that's inspired a few of you to have a go at testing. And for those of you that are, um, I know quite a few of you are, which is lovely. Um, is giving you a few insights. Absolutely. I'm definitely going to try it, Karen. Thank you. <laughs> okay, I that's great, like Cora. <laughs> yes, definitely. I'm, I'm absolutely trying this. <laughs> okay, um, I think Christine is just typing a question as well. Yes, yes. Okay. And adrenal stress. Good yeah, effect. I can come yeah. back and do one. Okay, that's lovely. Thank you, Christine. Yeah, I can come back and do one on adrenal stress and hair analysis together. I'd be more than happy to do that. Yeah, I think I overdid the slides good. this time because I just wanted I have that I wanted to give you lots of information. And also it's the first webinar I've done and I've learned loads doing this. So I'd really like to thank you all for being my audience. Yes, thank you, Karen. Yes, I, I agree with Caroline. I would love to to um, see something on the metabolic typing that you mentioned. Okay, um, and so something I'm actually writing at the moment is um, I'm writing um, a booklet on the on hair analysis and using it in practice. And I've written a whole chunk on the metabolic type because it's quite complicated. And so what I'll do, Cora, when it's finished, which should be about four or five weeks, when it's all tidied up and presented nicely i'll get in touch with you and that's something that we can offer to an nna members oh that would be great thank you so much karen that would be wonderful so everyone who's on the webinar has had a little insight into that coming mm -hmm. excellent so don't forget the webinar uh, recording will be available within a week or so uh you'll be sent a link with um within an email to the webinar and also with the slides where you can download it. So thank you so much, Karen, for joining us and for the very thoughtful webinar.
And thank you everyone for participating and hopefully I'll see you all very soon again. Okay, thank you all. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.